All right, so last time uh, we talked about the uh, different criteria that you can use uh, to um, explain or uh, that you can use to organize different uh, organisms. And uh, we, we talked about that you could do it based on symmetry. You could do it based on the number of germ layers. You can do it based on whether or not you have a cavity in addition to the gut. And if you do, is it a real cavity or not? Which really just means, is it lined by mesoderm on both sides? And the last one is uh, you can organize it based on whether the organism is a protostome or a deuterostome. And the textbook gives you several different features of what makes a protostome a protostome and what makes a deuterostome a deuterostome. And I want to tell you this, most of those, they're lies. <laughs> they're just, I mean, it's like, if you, you know, so if you have the rule in spelling that it's like I before E except after C, and you're like, that works really nicely, there are a couple of exceptions, but it works pretty nicely, right? That's not a lie. It's like, this is a rule with some exceptions to this rule. Most of the things that they give you, there are so many exceptions that it's not a rule with some exceptions. It's just, it's just a lie. It's, there's just no really, there's really no way around that. So here is one of those lies for you. So protostomes and deuterostomes. Notice here we have a coelom, and in this case it's a true coelom lined by mesoderm on both sides. You see that? So it is not a fake coelom, also known as what? A pseudo coelom. Okay, this is a real coelom, but here it's showing you in protostomes, it forms off of the endoderm and ectoderm as like an independent entity and then spreads out to fill that space. And then in deuterostomes, you, you, you form these buds off of the gut that then become the coelom, right? You see that that's what this diagram is, is showing you. Okay, here you just get this mesoderm that opens up separate from endoderm and ectoderm, and then spreads to fill the space. Here we have buds off of the gut that then spread to fill that space. You see that this is what the diagram is showing you? Yeah. This, this is not true at all. We are deuterostomes, but this is how our coelom develops. And you're like, okay, well, that's, that's one exception, right? We're humans. Every single vertebrate <laughs> species is a deuterostome, but as far as we can tell, I mean, we haven't studied development in every single vertebrate species, but as far as we can tell, it always develops this way. And so it's like, well, now this isn't a rule with some exceptions. This is just an outright deception to try to show you the difference between protostomes and deuterostomes. They're really not all that different. Yeah, Levi. Um, so there are some developmental differences, and those I pointed out when I gave you the list of, like, when we classify humans as deuterostomes, it's because we have, it's because we have uh, radial indeterminate cleavage versus the spiral determinate cleavage. Those are real developmental differences. Uh, and so what spiral means is that the two layers of cells at the eight cell stage, they are offset. They're not sitting right on top of one another. It almost looks like the... the the eight cell stage has spiraled, right? Twisted a little bit, right? That's legitimate. Uh, determinate cleavage, it means once those cells, once the original zygote divides, the cells are already inhibited from becoming certain things based on where they're located. Whereas in a deuterostome, it's indeterminate. You can take one cell off of even a really late embryo, like say a 64 cell stage, you can take one cell off and it'll develop into an entire individual. And that's how identical twins happen, in case you were wondering. And so that's not possible in protostomes. It is possible in deuterostomes. So those are legitimate differences. Um, also, the first opening uh, in a protostome becomes the mouth. When you, so right, right here, when you, when you first start to form the gut, this first opening becomes the mouth in a protostome. The second opening becomes the mouth in a deuterostome. So after the, the gut fully forms and then goes and, and hits another opening, that second opening becomes the mouth and the deuterostome. That, again, is another legitimate developmental difference. And protostome means first mouth, means the first opening becomes the mouth. Deuterostome means second mouth. Second opening becomes the mouth. Those are legitimate de developmental differences. Yeah. What's that? 
Yes. As far as how they, and I mean, obviously there are going to be developmental differences between a vertebrate and an insect, right? They're two completely different organisms. They're going to have some developmental differences, but not in terms of how you make the coelom. Is this bothering you? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, it's, it's, it's for my nausea. Yeah, sorry. So our fourth question. So our fourth question from chapter 27. Why are so many animals eucelimates and bilaterally symmetrical? We dealt with this question sort of last time when we said, why are we... Uh, structurally so similar to so many different animals. Well, now let's, let's, let's start dealing with this. So I already mentioned this to you last time uh, on Friday, that uh, cephalization, defining a head region, tends to accompany bilateral symmetry. And I think I, I said something really weird, like if you ripped a head off of a butterfly, would it still... Anyways, sorry about that. Or you're welcome for that, depending on how that statement worked out. I will not apologize for the other thing that happened at the end of our class on Friday when I told you if you pass an intestinal roundworm and you open up the anus, you can see how large, far you can launch. I won't apologize for that. You're welcome for that. So uh, what this does is, is defining a specific head region is allows the organism to move in a very coordinated way. Now, we, we already talked about radial symmetry allows an organism to interact with its environment in 360 degrees, right? That is, that is absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> but you cannot move in a coordinated, focused way without bilateral symmetry and a defined head region. You can't do it. So you're like, yeah, you can interact with your environment in 360 degrees, but you're really limited in what you can do in response to that. And you're like, what about a jelly? They swim around, sort of. They really swim up and down, and then water currents carry them other places. So, I mean, if you get stung by a jelly, it wasn't really hunting you out. It was sort of an accident, although that doesn't change the way it makes you feel, right? The intent of the predator is really not what's in question. It's really your response to it, right? How did it make you feel inside and outside? It's painful. So bilateral symmetry, it's good for directed movement. Uh, you coelomates have greater structural flexibility, greater durability, greater efficiency of movement of materials inside the body. And so having a true coelom allows you to have greater flexibility, have a more durable body plan, move materials inside with greater efficiency. We're like, man, this all sounds really good, right? We can move in a very focused way, and we have a highly flexible, durable, efficient body plan. That's good, right? That sounds good. So what that means is, is that any animals that have these features, bilateral symmetry and a true coelom, are going to have a high level of environmental and structural flexibility. It makes sense? They can interact with their environment in very focused and intentional ways, and they have very flexible, efficient, and durable body plans. Well, that's good. That's good. So then really what the question becomes... Is it, is it the presence of these features? Is it the presence of bilateral symmetry and a UCLMA body plan that allows the greater diversity? Or does diversity, diversity require those features? Do you have a biomechanical, is it a biomechanical necessity if you're going to be an animal with really focused intentional movement and a flexible, durable, efficient body plan, is it a biomechanical necessity that you are bilaterally symmetrical and have a, a U-coelum? Okay? So then really what the question becomes is, can we explain this not because of shared ancestry, right? We aren't bilaterally symmetrical like an ant is bilaterally symmetrical because we share a bilaterally symmetrical ancestor, Rather, we are bilaterally symmetrical like an ant is bilaterally symmetrical because they are, that is a biomechanical necessity to interact with the environment the way we interact with the environment and the way ants interact with their environment. Make sense? 
or we aren't true coelomates like ants are true coelomates because we share an ancestor that was a true coelomate, but rather we are true coelomates like ants are true coelomates because it is a biomechanical necessity in order to have a flexible, efficient, and durable body plan that allows you to actually interact with your environment in a meaningful way. That makes sense? Okay, so we're gonna take a lecture break. And I want you to take a, I don't know, take a minute and a half, 90 seconds, and I want you talking to the, 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 the people around you, I want you to come up with what are some of the implications if we allow the argument that the reason we share these features is because they are a biomechanical necessity. If we allow that argument to be an alternative to we share these features because we share ancestry, right? We allow a second argument that says, no, we don't share these features because we share ancestry. Instead, we share these features because they are a biomechanical necessity. What are some of the implications of allowing that second argument? All right, 90 seconds. Come up with one, maybe two. If you're really motivated and ambitious, come up with three implications of allowing that second argument. Okay, 90 seconds, starting now. Yes. All righty. What are some of these implications? What do we got? What do we got? If we allow this second argument, what are some of the implications of that, Amanda? Um, it it uh, allows like a, a better chance of survival because it's if you were to take a, a sea star and put into a forest, it wouldn't really survive very well in the forest because it has radial symmetry. Yeah, that's part of the reason why, sure. <laughs> um, so regardless of whether or not it can survive with water. But if, if you were to take a wolf and put it into the forest, the wolf can, can easily navigate the forest and, and, and able to track down its prey. Yeah, so radial symmetry works nice in aquatic environments, right? Where you can interact with your environment in 360 degrees. And especially thinking if you're like an anemone, right? You can just, you just attach right down there to the substrate and things come to you, right? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But if you actually have, if you need to move in a focused way, radial symmetry is very challenging. Very challenging. And so terrestrial environments present some huge challenges uh, for radially symmetrical organisms. And so now... Uh, what you're getting at then is if we allow this second argument, it allows us to explain form based on necessity, right? It allows us to explain differences in form, not because of differences in ancestry, but because of differences in necessity, right? To live the kind of lifestyle that those organisms live. Good. What else? Yeah, Cameron.
Sure. Yeah. I mean, so what it does is it it, it limit. I, I'll say, I'll say this. It limits the descriptive power of universal common descent. Right. This idea that organisms share features because they share ancestry, right? So if we put the focus on rather the shared features are because of shared need, right? And if they have a similar function, they need to have a similar structure. We've talked about this before, right? Function is not independent of structure, right? Would you agree? Function is not independent of structure, and instead, structure determines function. Those of you that have taken anatomy, you know that, right? Structure determines function. You take anatomy, you take physiology, you get that, right? It's just, it's just part of that. And then so what, what that means then, if, if you're going to carry out a similar function, you have to have a similar structure in order to facilitate that. Good. Yeah, any other implications? I think it gives us a better way to explain... Why do you have organisms share structures when their common ancestor would be really, really far back, right? Really far back. Like, so for instance, if you're going to go to the most recent common ancestor between humans and ants, I kept using that example, you have to go basically back to the original bilaterally symmetrical animal, which is proposed uh, to have lived somewhere around a billion years ago, okay? Which means that now any of those shared features between the groups, you would default to saying it's because of that shared ancestry. And then any other animal in between, now you have to start to explain why don't they have some of those features, okay? Whereas we could, if we can explain this based on shared needs, uh, it gives us an alternative, all right? Does that make sense? Okay. Because remember, it's helpful to be able to answer these questions. You know, just that out there. All right, so our next question. How have genetics changed the story of animal evolution? So up until the 1970s and really the 1980s, uh, genetic markers were not used at all in building the evolutionary histories of organisms. It was entirely based on morphological uh, data. Okay, it was entirely based on shared features. But in the 1970s, especially in the 1980s, there, there was a shift, right? And I've used this example before. Emerson, sorry to pick on you again. But, you know, the reason Emerson is more like her siblings genetically than she is like me genetically is because they share a more recent common ancestor, right? We, we, I've mentioned this before. And so that idea then has rippled into all areas of animal phylogeny. Okay, so the question is, how has this changed? Well, what we find is that these morphological similarities uh, can be superficial. Uh, or, because we've allowed this second argument, they may be developed to meet similar challenges. Maybe they have nothing to do with shared ancestry or that the ancestor had those features, therefore both the groups of descendants have those features. And instead we, we, we say, you know, convergence, and that's the... Uh, two different lineages getting the same feature because of a shared need uh, provides a better explanation for these similarities than shared ancestors. So this entire slide here, not the entire slide, but this slide is heavily influenced by allowing that second argument from our previous uh, slide. So now we're left with, okay, well now we're not so confident that shared physical features are an indication of common ancestry, right? Because they could rather be an indication of bio biomechanical necessity, right? That makes sense? So then we're like, well, what do we do then? How do we figure out then if it's because of shared ancestry or if it's because of a, a biomechanical necessity? And the answer is we use genetics, right? Again, this example that I keep using of... of of Emerson and I, although it could very easily be anybody else, right? It could be Micah and I, or Russell and I, or Calvin and I, right? Do you have any siblings, Micah? You have three siblings. Would you predict that you are more like them genetically than you are like me? Why? 
because you share a more recent common ancestor with your siblings than you do with me, right? Luckily for you, because you don't want to hang around at my family reunions, right? I don't know what your families are like. My family is fun, right? Lots of fun. Very interesting. Yeah. So genetics provides us then a, an alternative tool, and genetic similarities are more difficult to explain by biomechanical necessity, right? Is it biomechanically necessary that we share more genetic similarities to our siblings than we do to people that aren't our siblings? Not at all, right? It's rather very easy to explain because of shared ancestry. So genetics provides, uh, in, in many ways, a, a very powerful and robust tool. So here are some things that genetics has really helped to support uh, as far as animal groupings are concerned. So it had always been assumed that the sponges are the most primitive. And we, and we mentioned something on Friday to suggest that this was true. And what was that? What is true of sponges? They don't have complex tissues. They are the only animals without complex tissues. Meaning that as far as our hierarchy of, of, of biological complexity goes, the highest level of complexity they have are the cellular level of, of complexity. So these had already been assumed to be the most primitive, and genetic data support that. They, all animals group closer to each other than they do to sponges, all other animals. Another thing supported by genetic data is that radiates are separate from bilaterians. And radiates are animals with what type of symmetry? Radial. Radial. Look at that. That's critical thinking right there. That's nice. So radiates are animals with radial symmetry. What about bilaterians? They are animals with bilateral symmetry. Okay? And so those had already been separated because of their symmetry. And what you find is radially symmetrical animals are more similar genetically than they are to any bilaterally symmetrical animals. Except for some. You mentioned uh, sea stars, right? You said, did you say starfish or sea stars? Uh, the actual, a lot of people call them starfish, but the actual term for them is sea stars. Uh, like the I agree. Fish. They aren't fish. Yeah. I mean, both, you can use both and, and both are technically true, but sea stars are preferable because they are not fish, right? In the same way, uh, ladybugs... They're not bugs, so we should call them lady beetles. You know, originally they were called lady birds. Uh, that one I really don't understand. But anyways, that's bonus information for you. Um, protostomes from deuterostomes. And again, we had already separated them from each other based on developmental differences, and genetics supports that. That protostomes are more similar to each other genetically than they are uh, to deuterostomes. Okay, and you're like, well, this is, this doesn't seem good, right? We're less convinced of morphological similarities indicating common ancestry. So we added in another tool, and yet we're getting the same relationships we got using morphological differences. So here, let's talk about some differences. Genetics restructured some of the animal phylogeny. Genetics have restructured some of the um, phylogeny. For instance... It separated protostomes into two groups. Separated protostomes into two groups. One called ectocozoa and one called lophotrochozoa. Oh, these are fun words. Ectocozoa, lophotrochozoa. And uh, here's a problem. We have polytomies in each of these groups. Somebody explain to me what a polytomy is and why this is an issue. So if I were to draw a polytomy, I'm going to draw a branch, and then what's going to happen to it? Splits up into what? More than two branches. Look at this, right? This is not a pitchfork. It's a polytomy. If it were a pitchfork, that would be right there. Right? And it would probably have four times, because three times are less than four. All right? So we've got a polytomy, and why is this an issue? This is not how speciation works, right? Speciation works, you get, we've, we've talked about this already, right? A, a population splits into two reproductively isolated populations, and then they start to diverge, become different. Yes? We talked about this? So this isn't how speciation works. That's an issue. 
It, it tells us that our relationships are unresolved. We have very little confidence in how these three groups are related to one another, and we have very uh, little idea of what this ancestor would even look like. Does it look more like this group, this group, or this group? We have no, really no idea. Okay, so genetics created an interesting problem for us in trying to root all animals back to a single ancestor. But they're just animals, right? It's just one part. It's only about two million described species. We shouldn't have this much trouble actually rooting them all back. And then one additional thing is it created a new phylum, Acelomorpha. Acelomorpha. So genetic evidence created an additional phylum. It took this group here, Acelomorpha, and actually pulled it out of another phylum. Sorry. It's, it's really far down there. But yeah, you have these slides, right? These slides are on Canvas, and this video will be on Canvas, or the link to it will be on Canvas soon. Yeah, Chris. What, uh, what Acelomorpha. They are uh, various types of worms that lack a cavity in addition to the gut. So they used to be placed, let's see if we can see it here. Yeah. So, um, Acelomorpha, all of the organisms that are put here, used to be put in this phylum here along with other, these are flatworms that also lack a coelom in addition to the gut or a cavity in addition to the gut. But now genetic information pulled them out and actually grouped them apart from all of the other groups. So you see that right now they are, you had this branch split into two and then the one branch produces basically all of our other bilaterally symmetrical animals and then this branch produces our acelomorph. So here's a polytomy in Lophotrochozoa, right? This is an issue. I told you there were polytomies in both. This figure is a little bit um, not deceiving because they only include two phyla, but there are four phyla in here. And so you actually have a four-way polytomy if you include all four phyla. Hmm. Anyone by perchance, just throwing this out there, anyone know what one of the missing phyla is in this? Tardigrades. You know what tardigrades are? Moss piglets, water piglets, water bears, moss bears, whatever you want to call them. Really cool. Yeah, it's totally, totally awesome animals. You can, so they live on moss, which is why we call them moss piglets or moss bears. And, and you know about moss, right? It's a terrestrial plant that relies on water for reproduction. When water isn't present, when it dries up, it can't reproduce and, and the plant really goes a little dormant. Well, the moss piglets living on them, they go dormant as well. And so what they did was they took these, they took some water with tardigrades on it and they smeared it along the side of a space shuttle that was going to the space station. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but the space station is in space. <laughs> and I also don't know if you knew this or not, but there's not a lot of water in space. Yeah, there really isn't. And so it goes out into space. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but going through the atmosphere, it's, it's just very interesting, especially in re-entry, because you're going through really, really fast, and the surface of the space shuttle experiences immense and incredible heat, right? So then the space shuttle returns from the space station. They scrape the tardigrades off the side of the space shuttle, add a little bit of water, and they come back to life like nothing even happened. No problem. No problem for the tardigrades. Put tardigrades into space, no big deal. They don't even care. <laughs> like while they're in space, it's not that great. So they go dormant and then they come back and they're just fine. They're just fine. Anyways, we'll talk more about tardigrades in, I don't know, maybe next week, but probably uh, the week after. Fantastic, fantastic little animals. They are cute. They are cute. I will give you that. All right, let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, so there are a few pictures from your textbook uh, that give you some, I don't know, some idea of the diversity of living forms. So here's an example of an ectosozoan. All insects are in that group, ectosozoa, one of our protostome groups, along with tardigrades and onocophorans and nematodes. Okay, they're all in there. 
And then here's an example of a Lophotrochozoan. I mean, this thing, you wouldn't even think it's an animal. We're going to talk about tardigrades in a couple of weeks. They are, I know. So here's Lophotrochozoa, two different protostome groups, again, created uh, because of genetic differences. And then just within insects, an enormous amount of diversity. You have some insects that have what's called direct development. They hatch basically as a very tiny version of the adult, and then they just grow from there. You have some insects that have um, incomplete metamorphosis where they hatch as a tiny wingless version of the adult and then go through. And then you have some insects that have complete metamorphosis, right, where they hatch as something that looks absolutely nothing like the adult and then goes through a series of morphological changes until you get to the adult form. And so all of that, just to show you some of the incredible diversity in these protostome groups, which to you should go as evidence to explain why do we have these polytomies, right? It's because there's an enormous amount of diversity and trying to root all of those animals back to a single ancestor is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, all right? It is currently 12.25, and I told you that our class was going to end today at 12.25, so that is it. We have, I think, two more questions to go over from Chapter 27, but we'll save that for Wednesday. You bet.